<clears throat> All right, welcome everybody. It looks like we are live. I'm Scott. This is Drawing Together with Artist Network. Today we're working on this drawing of this kitten. Um, it, it should be a fun one. Um, I So this preparatory sketch, uh, it kicked my butt, <laughs> I have to say. It was really hard. This is the second attempt. So actually what we're working on today is going to be my third attempt because the first one did not go well at all. And so I want to kind of talk through why that did, why that um, happened. Um, kind of a few quick notes too. I kind of adjusted things a little bit. As you can see, I have this, this microphone here. Um, so if the audio seems off at all, uh, just let me know. Um, I'm trying something out here. So I, my, my goal is to try to continually improve things. I also adjusted the lights in, in part because the um, the the graphite that I used here, the ebony pencil, it it was really shining. Of these dark areas that we built up a lot of shine, and it was not it was not doing very well at all. So I adjusted the lights a little bit to make it good for the the drawing. Um, so hopefully it all works well for everybody. Um, I see everybody chiming in. I love to see where you are all uh, viewing from. I know here in Colorado, we were grateful for the snow that we had to help take down uh, some of the, the smoke from all the fires burning around here. So anybody from California, anybody from Cal uh, from Colorado, anyone in the in the West here, hope, hope you're uh, managing the fire as well. Uh, so. Uh, we're going to get right into it today. So um, the materials are relatively simple today. I've got my ebony pencil. If you have a graphite, you know, 6B, 8B, a soft one is really the key here. I like to work with the soft materials, and I've talked a bit about this before because um, you, if you have a, a complete drawing set, that can be great where you have, you know, a 4H, 2H, H, 2B, 4B, 6B, etc. You have the full range of hardnesses. Um, that can be really helpful. What I found for myself and just the way I work is if I start with some of those lighter, harder materials, it can sometimes kind of scratch the surface of the paper or create these embossed lines, things like that, that I found that for me, what works best is to just go straight towards a darker, softer material and use a lighter touch for some of the lighter marks. Um, but again, you just wanted to like, you want to kind of work, use what works best for you. So if you um, prefer to start the drawing with a harder material, I think that works just fine as well. If you happen to be working in charcoal, that's going to work also. So, um, I am going to be bringing in, this is a Cretacolor Nero pencil, so it's a dark, I believe it's an oil-based drawing pencil that can kind of float on top of the graphite, and I'll be using that for some of the darker areas to really pump up that contrast. So this is, um, the, you know, the concepts that we're going to be dealing with today uh, can be applied to pretty much any drawing material. So if you're using charcoal, if you're using just one of these Krita colors or, you know, any other drawing tool, I think it's going to really going to work well for this. So, um, <clears throat> That's what we're working on. This is about an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. This is just a smooth drawing paper. And you can see I kind of initiated the drawing. Um, it's a little bit light here, but I started to kind of work out the, the proportions. That's what tripped me up to begin with. So this, this drawing is really all about edges. And so my initial attempt was to start by just building up blocks of value and then finding the proportions inside of that, if that makes sense. Um, and what I found is that then those proportions were wildly off. So what I it instead did is I kind of started with a, when I switched to just kind of a, a light kind of layout of the basic features, the ears, the eyes, and the, the nose in particular, if I once it, locking those down and getting those proportions right, um, I could build from there and eventually kind of get rid of those lines. We've talked a lot about that in the series that there's really two ways that you can approach a drawing. There's a linear approach and then there's a shape approach. Um, and you can blend the two together. You're gonna find a balance between there. So you can initiate a drawing through line or you can initiate a drawing through shape and eventually find the balance that, that works well for you. Um, in this case, I initially tried to start it just by thinking about it in terms of shape and that's the part that kicked my butt. So <laughs> I kind of adjusted from there. Um, the Karen is asking a question just briefly about sh uh, shaving the, the pencil down. Um, let, me, let me pull out my, my blade. So it's really just being gentle with it to get that sharp point. 
um, actually I'm not in the shot right there. So if I go, if I take my thumb and I'm kind of, I'm actually pulling the, 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 uh, the pencil down across the blade, um, that it is ultimately what's going to give me that nice sharp point. And then you can always, you know, use a sheet of sandpaper and sand it down from there. Um, but that's how I get that sharp point. And I did that with both of these. Although this um, this dark drawing pencil is a little bit softer and it kept breaking. So I, I've lost a lot of that. You can see how much of this pencil I've already used up here. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully that answers your questions. Um, so throughout this uh, this whole process, if you're new, feel free to answer or ask any questions and I'll do my best to answer them. And if I can't answer them, anybody who's, who's joining us is in this whole community, they can help give you the answer you need. The reference image is in the description below. You can bring that up. And then I also encourage you to share your work uh, with the community of artists at, at Artist Network. Uh, there's a link in the description with a with the, the link to the show page where you can share your work. You can rewatch this episode if you'd like. Um, and it's really awesome to see everybody's work. So um, if the audio is, is the audio straight? Oh, you know, it's really peaking. Let's see if that works better. Um, I had bumped I had bumped a dial and that was really peaking the audio. So let me see if this works. Um, all right, how's that sound? Is that better, everybody? Thank you for pointing that out. If if something does happen, um, the and especially with the with the internet, I know I, I don't know if it was the snow or not out here. The, um, the internet's been kind of off and on throughout the week, and so if um, if it does drop, just hang on for a few seconds, or you know, 30 seconds or so, and I'm going to do my best to kind of bring that back up. If I can't, I will do my best to communicate that to everybody and you know, figure out what we can do from there. So um, Grace is asking a question. So I struggle to draw not on a slant. My drawing surface lies flat on a table, but I, I don't have the same problem when painting upright on an easel. Do you have any tips? So Grace, it sounds like what you're you're saying that it's easier for you to draw on a flat surface. It's easier to paint upright, um, and, or so if things are kind of a moving. Let me think about that. I'm not quite sure if I can answer that fully. I mean, a lot of it just kind of comes down to practice, and what it may be is drawing from the arm more than the wrist. That tends to be the bigger thing that I notice with uh, especially beginning students that are just kind of getting used to it but a lot of artists that will just kind of get in the habit of really relying on the wrist movement um, which is somewhat limited if you draw from your shoulder and with the elbow you you get larger kind of uh, a greater variety of of and range of motion that way um, shoot so it, you can't hear much um, let me, okay, I'm going to take a few seconds. Let me plug in this other mic and unplug this one. So I'll be, be right back. I ran a bunch of tests on the audio and it all worked before, so. One of the reasons is I've got this long cable that tends to get in the way. All right, is this better? No, that's really peaking. All right, bring that down. How's that? Is that better? Just want to make sure that it works for everybody. I can drop this out. Okay. <clears throat> All right, back at it. <laughs> Thanks for the patience, this is live. So, um, watching from Brazil, awesome, thank you all. Okay, um, yeah, so I'd love to hear again where you're, you're viewing from. We had people from all over the world last episode and that was wicked awesome to see. Um, so as you can see, again, the, the basic layout here, I wanna now block in the values. So the big thing with, 
essentially this is a portrait that we're working on is it's so easy to get absorbed by the the proportions and the features themselves but um, but and lose sight of the the overall structure and especially the light and value so um, thank you for the, your patience with the audio issues trying something new didn't quite work so we go back to what worked before um, so going back to what I was just saying before is you know it's so easy when we when we focus on a particular area it, it's, it's the way our brain is designed is when we focus on something we by necessity tend to ignore other things and one of the things that we ignore when we're focusing especially on the features is the broad shapes of light and shadow um, and I, that's where I, I wanted to make sure in my initial attempt that I addressed those early on, but then I was not able to build the correct proportions out of that. And that's where I really struggled. So I'm trying to find kind of a hybrid model. So if, if you're following along, take some time to try to map out the placement of the, the eyes uh, and the ears. And so what you want to do is you want to look at, you know, try to find... <clears throat> kind of key points in each of the elements. And it's difficult with a creature like this that is so incredibly soft. You, you, there's, no, there's no really definable edge. You know, it's not like my arm where you can see a clear line, right? Um, so you have to de determine points. And I like to use these kind of dark spots at the base of the ears as a basic unit. Compare that to the distance between them compare that to the distance between the two dark spots on the next ear, compare that to the height. Um, and, and you can do that with the reference photo and you can use your pencil using the, the com uh, comparative measuring to um, help relay those. So essentially you have like this, this triangle that it, it's uh, essentially an equilateral triangle. The space between the ears is pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio there. Um, and then you can take that same um, relationship and that, that same distance and compare it to the distance between, let's say, this dark spot and the eye. And then from there, you continue to refine your proportions. So it's better to get information on the page first and then adjust than, rather than try to work that out in your head first and then just strike and get that, get that drawing uh, get those proportions locked in there, if that makes sense. So get something on there and then adjust from there. I wanted to get this thing going because I know this is going to take a while to get through, so I wanted to try to accelerate the process a little bit. <clears throat> Oh, Mary's having issues with audio. I'm not sure if anybody else, I don't know what it, everything seems good on my end um, in terms of the audio. It seems to be playing back. So I hope it's not uh, a widespread issue. Um, if it is, like if, if you are having trouble, just try refreshing the page. Um, we had that issue with Johannes's live stream yesterday. Some people just had to refresh the YouTube link and that seemed to fix stuff. So let me know if there are any additional issues. Uh, Bianca's asking, is this an Apple Watch? Yes, it's an Apple Watch. So, <laughs> um, okay, good. Um, oh, I see, yeah, so uh, thank you for calling that out, Grace, that yeah, if you, um, if you want the reference image, it's best to bring that up on your own screen so you can find the link there. Um, I'm not able to make that adjustment on my end. The audio is really peaking quite a bit. Okay. Oh, I'm glad this is working, Mary, saying that you've been working on your own cats. Um, so I'm just using the, the side of my pencil right now, and that's one of the reasons I like to use the razor blade to sharpen it is because I like to engage as much of the side of the pencil as possible. I have the full um, reference image off here, right off to my left, right next to the chat, uh, and that's what I'm working from. And now at this phase, I'm having, I let my eyes kind of lose focus, and I'm trying to 
observe the big shapes of light and shadow. And as I'm doing that, I'm trying to be mindful of some of those initial lines so I don't lose them. As you can see, I kind of darken the eyes in a little bit um, just to at least mark off the spot where they belong. Um, even if I don't get the shape right, I can at least get the placement right. That's most critical at this stage is getting some of those um, areas mapped out. But what I'm thinking about here is I'm looking at these shapes of values. I'm trying to think about them as shapes and, and kind of avoid that instinct in me that wants to outline it and, and use the tip of the pencil to create a line that I then fill in. And there's uh, one of the, the advantages to working on this subject here is the, um, the opportunity to explore uh, positive and negative spatial relationships. So in this case, as I work on this background here, I'm working on the shape of that background and letting that, um, letting that build the shape of the, you know, the back of, of the cat there. So, um, just trying to get information on the page quickly. So as I'm building up these areas, I'm trying to make it a fairly smooth transition. And so as I'm, as I'm drawing the pencil down, as I'm dragging it across the paper, I'm also gradually rolling it in my fingers and just using the weight of the pencil. And, and in that way, I can create a fairly smooth tone without strong marks there. From Switzerland, all right. Austria is loud and clear. All right, and this, this picture here, uh, this is from Little Mitt's Ragdolls. This is the kitten that they currently have. I think was, so the other cat we had drawn um, early on, uh, we, uh, that was from the same, same cattery. All right, so the, we can observe, if we, you know, if we look at the right side of the drawing, if we look at the right side of the reference photo, you can really see how dark that is. We have a strong play between dark and then light. Uh, and we can observe on this side, there is a noticeable structure in, in light and shadow. There are some noticeable dark shapes. Um, but if we put our attention here, uh, you know, if we actually, if we put our focus here, if we look at this side, but we put our attention over here, we can kind of gauge that value relationship. And what happens is that this almost just gets washed out. It's very, very subtle over here. So I'm gonna actually leave that alone for now and just let this be a large white shape. And then eventually I'm gonna move into blocking in some of those forms. So what, I, what I'm trying to do now is first just build a kind of tone map um, using the graphite. And I'm changing the direction of my marks because I'm trying to create a kind of a smooth area here. And, you know, as, as we said, like this, the last few episodes have really been a lot about, um, about edges and the importance of edges. And, you know, with this, with this subject, there are hardly any <laughs> hard edges. Like there's just a few little key points where you can find kind of a sharp edge. And that's ultimately what's going to pull this thing together. All right. So again, I'm squinting my eyes. And as I'm looking for these areas of kind of the darker darks, like right in here, the base of that post that the cat's sitting against, I'm trying to, I'm doing a quick check-in to make sure I'm in the right spot relative to where I've started to map out the mouth here. And so as you're, as you're going through this, you know, always be checking in, always be comparing where you are um, in one spot with another spot in the drawing. That's so much about drawing is actually splitting your attention. So you're working in one area where you may be thinking about another and then moving, putting all your thoughts onto that area you're now working on and then maybe you, it, your attention diverts somewhere else. Uh, and this is where, you know, I can tend to be um, easily distracted Right, and that it serves me well in drawing, because you know my mind will will be I'll be working on an area on one spot, and then my mind will just 
instantly go to another area just without really thinking a whole lot about it. Um, but that serves me well in drawing because, um, because it allows me to check in to make sure everything is, is placed properly. Uh, and then using the side of the pencil, uh, it, it really discourages me from creating those harder lines. And I'm going to move from kind of a soft focus to a harder focus as we go through. And I'm not worried about the, the fur. The managing detail is really a big thing in drawing as well. And it's so easy to get absorbed by the details here, like the whiskers, right, and the, the fur. We're going to deal with that a little bit later. Right now, I want to get the value structure, the light and shadow structure established. <clears throat> Uh, so if, and if I encourage you all, like, I'd love to hear from you, you know, any suggestions of what I should do next, you know, whether I should try to stay working on one area, move to another. Um, I'm kind of going kind of instinctively through the drawing and then trying to articulate what that instinct is. But I'm also open to suggestions from you all if I need to, uh, kind of adjust things a little bit, maybe approach the drawing in a slightly different way. So I'm, I'm holding this, this pencil in this, this kind of modified over, overhand grip. So, you know, the basic pencil grips you have, you have a, a tripod grip. This is, this is typically how people hold a pencil, especially how we, that's how we were taught to write. An overhand grip um, you achieve by simply placing the pencil on the, on the paper, picking it up with your fingertips, and kind of going from there, maybe letting it roll under your, your fingers just a touch. Um, I like to have this, <clears throat> this kind of modified grip where I have it wedged between my fingers. So that gives me some support and control similar to this, this tripod grip, but it also allows me to keep the side of the pencil engaged. And, and I can just kind of rotate my wrist up a bit when I need to get more of that tip kind of working for me. Uh, so if I'm working on this area here, for example, and I need to get a sharper edge, I can kind of just roll my hand up and that gives me a little bit more precision without really having to change my grip, without having to actually let go of the pencil, grab it again, and then go back into that overhand. Uh, so that's the that's the kind of the, the thought process there. And that's something that I kind of I, de I developed this grip naturally. And what works for you may be something completely different. It may develop com completely differently for you. I mean, I know other artists that have worked this way. Um, but it's something that you just kind of f fell into. Um, but I know at first, working with an overhand grip in particular, breaking the habit of the tripod grip, breaking the habit was really hard at first. So um, if you're struggling with that, it's totally understandable. Uh, this, this grip also allows me to create these nice kind of circular marks if I need to break up the directionality of marks. So if I'm, if I'm observing strong directional marks, so if I were to go like this, right, I can see those marks pretty clearly. I can get rid of that by using these circular marks, or I can avoid that to begin with. And if you do get strong marks, what helps to eliminate them is to then focus on the spaces between them, kind of fill in those gaps and then kind of feather it all out and, and keep building layers from there. So you can always recover a drawing. Um, Medieval Peasant is asking about the temperature of the paper. Um, I, I think it does to some degree matter, but it's m generally more critical uh, for me when working with charcoal because charcoal itself can vary in temperature. Uh, uh, um, a, a vine or willow charcoal may be cooler in temperature than some compressed charcoals, and then you'll notice a difference in temperature with uh, different brands as well. Uh, and and in, in that regard, the, the temperature of the paper can, it can impact that as well. So um, with graphite, it's naturally a cool medium, um, and you might have some sort of conflict. You, it might be better for you to have a, a, a cooler paper for, for graphite, but I, in general, I haven't really notice that it impacts things a whole lot. The tooth of the paper is, for me, more, more important. So this is relatively smooth, but you can see the tooth of the paper here, which is going to serve us well for the, um, the texture. All right. 
Hello, hello. Okay, and if there are any other questions, feel free to shout them out. Is anybody else following along? I'm just kind of curious, or do you prefer to kind of watch and then do you go back and watch it later and complete the drawing? Anybody using different materials? We've had that you know happen in many episodes here where um, you know I'll be working in charcoal, somebody will be working in graphite, vice versa. You might be working in toned paper. Um, love to hear what's working for you, what's not. And you may end up having kind of a different path altogether throughout the process of this drawing. And maybe we end up, you end up getting at the same, to the same spot in the drawing, uh, but just in a different way. Um, so I'm, as I'm looking at these, again, my eyes are still largely out of focus here, and I'm starting to see kind of more fine details, but I don't want sharp edges here. Uh, Daisy, has got a drawing with you, toned paper, all right. I'm excited to see how that turns out. I really had thought about using toned paper for this one. Um, and <clears throat> I wish I could really articulate why I didn't. Sometimes it's just a feeling I just didn't want to <laughs> when, I, when I did the initial one, so. Uh, so right here, you can see that dark spot. There's something underneath the paper that's causing that. So let me see. It's just a small impurity. Let me see what happens now. So it, to get rid of a spot like that, you know, what I like to do is just try to target it with an eraser. And I may not be able to get rid of it, but that lightens it up a little bit and then try to uh, kind of smooth the transition in the area around it. So something like that. And then if that's still too dark, I can just use my kneaded eraser to lift off from there. So it's first a matter of kind of smoothing out the abruptness of that edge and then lifting the value. Oh, uh, Zephy Lily saying, you're following along with a Derwent Ar Onyx. I am really excited to try one of those out. Um, uh, I really like Derwent stuff and I'm in the process of reacquiring new materials, and I got a bunch of Derwent products that I'm gonna be trying out, so I'm super excited about that. Um, Mary's saying you like to watch first, and then go back and draw with the recording. That's good to know. And so, and if for you, if you're kind of new, one of the things we talk about, actually it'd be kind of curious, <laughs> Um, I'd be curious to hear from you all who have been with us for a while. If somebody is new to this this whole show and watching my drawing for the first time, you know, there's something that I, I talk about a lot in terms of the process and how a drawing evolves. And I'd be curious to hear from you all um, how you would put that into words. Um, All right, so I'm really just kind of going through and refining more. I see these two dark spots that are really starting to starting to bug me, and so I need to I need to pull those out a little bit. I think it actually I might just leave them as light spots for now because I think I just keep re recreating those. Big Mac twenty four, welcome. Twenty four K, welcome. Um, it's always awesome to see new people drawing with us. We meet every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern, with a new subject. The whole purpose of this series is to just use this time when so many of us are at home to really focus on building drawing skills. Um, again, I'm a, I'm a, you know, a lot of you have been with me for a while. You know that I'm a landscape painter primarily, and I had found that my drawing skills had been suffering through neglect <laughs> for a long time. And so that's what kind of helped pull this show together is I say, what happens if we all get together and we work on a subject and we choose a subject with an intention to improve a particular skill that we can apply to else, everything else. And we walk away with the drawing that we're happy with. So this isn't necessarily about, you know, making a drawing for someone or kind of, it's, it's really an exercise. There's a difference between 
drawing, the act of drawing, and the drawing. And in this, I really try to prioritize drawing itself, the act of it. And hopefully through the, the enjoyment of that act, the resulting object that we create is something that's pleasant and it captures all of that experience. Um, yeah, it's all about the lights and darks. Yeah, John is saying, yeah, essentially building from shape. So the, um, as, as Joan is saying, so we're talking about the difference between building, uh, building a drawing from line versus shape. And there are certainly some drawings that we'll address in this series that are going to be initiated through line. But I want to be, I want you all to think about drawing in such a way that it's about pulling the image out, right? It's like, drawing water from a well, you're pulling water out from that, you're dragging it to you. You're pulling this image out on the page and it's coming together gradually. You're starting from a point where you're, you've got the whole thing accounted for and then you're gradually bringing that into focus. Um, so that's the mindset here and that's why I'm not kind of finishing in one spot and, uh, and then moving on to the next. I want this thing, I want it to be almost like you're watching a camera come, come slowly into focus. And in that way, art is like magic. You know, if you think about, you know, what happens when you see an illusionist is, is that they can make something seem to appear out of thin air, right? We're doing that here, it just takes a little longer, right? So um, it doesn't happen, you know, in a, in a flash like it might on the stage of a, of a magician, so. Uh, Thomas Days is saying, really struggling with the proportions, ending up with a more mature cat than a kitten. That is exactly what I struggled with in that, my very first attempt. Um, one of the things that could be really helpful is if you print, if you print out the, the drawing, and it should be pretty close to this size here, I'm going to imagine that this is the photograph. Um, there are two ways that you can actually start to transfer some of those proportions. So if you were to lay this directly on top of if you're going to lay this directly on top of your drawing, you can simply kind of hover your pencil over, say, a key point like this, pull this away, and that's, you can see it always oh, actually pretty close to where I, was, where I needed it to be. Move to another point, and in that way, essentially transfer some of the key, the, the, the key um, proportions, and I think that'll really help to, to pull this together. Um, and, and you can do that with, you know, a lot of the key spots here. So like if in this area here, it's pretty ambiguous which spot to, to choose, but you can, um, you kind of find a dark, a dark area and start to build it that way. Another way to do it is to cover the back of your reference photo with graphite. It's a good way to sharpen your pencil. You flip it over and then you trace the image, you know, like some of the lines this way. And that, it's just like using a sheet of graphite paper where that graphite will transfer as a light line on your page. So if you, if you are struggling with that and you want to kind of get beyond those proportions, that's, a, that's one way to kind of correct it. So, uh, Jessica, that's a great way of describing it. Work the entire subject that you're drawing, building the drawing and going into the negative and positive areas of it. So yeah, you're working positive and negative space always bringing the drawing into focus as you go. Because you may decide for yourself that it's complete at a stage like this. You know, there's, there is a certain sense of drama that gets achieved when you allow the edges to become really diffused. Um, or you may decide that you really need those sharp edges and you can achieve both through this process uh, and this mindset of building as you go. The other thing that I'm mindful of is that I'm not, I'm not being precious with the white of the paper here. In fact, I can, I've got graphite on my, pa in my hand here. I can smudge this around. And if anything, that's gonna serve me well because I can erase out the highlights to get some of the brighter spots and think about positive and negative applications of the material kind of at the same time. Um, so don't be, is, or at least it's my recommendation. I don't like to tell people what to do. It's my recommendation that, you know, if you struggle with that instinct to protect the page, do your best to try to get rid of that. You know, let the material build up on the surface. Let it build up on your hand or if you need to, like a paper towel or something. Um, 
and if you build the drawing up as a whole all together, um, you, don't ha you, you don't have to fight that instinct to protect an area that you had already finished. So, uh, oh, I'm just seeing a, a Sue Wegger saying today's cat looks lower from the top. Yeah, I think, yeah, there's a, you know, it's, a, it's not placed precisely on the same page. You can see, um, you know, if I, if I look at these proportions, it'll look slightly off from the first one, and that's going to happen. Um, if I look at this initial drawing, actually, if I bring this back out, there's also kind of a narrowness to the face that, that seems a little bit off, and I'm not sure what that is. Um, and I'm going to try to correct that with this one here as well. Uh, Steven is saying, you purchased a pair of proportional dividers. That would be really interesting to, I've never done that, but I've seen them be used, um, and that can be really helpful. For me, I think getting those proportions correct and using comparative measuring starts to become an instinct. And I kind of like the I like the fight on the page a little bit, you know, a, a little bit, right? You know, like where you know you're really kind of struggling for those proportions. Like I said, the initial attempt I made at this cat, I was just wildly off, and I was more like I believe it was Thomas that was saying that you know, ended up looking like an older cat. Um, and so basically the scale of the ears, the scale of the eyes didn't line up. Um, and it did not look like this cat at all. And so um, that's an area where I, I probably should have stepped back and used something like a proportional divider. Instead, what I, I just kept fighting through the drawing. It never came together. And then eventually I just did it all over again. Um, not gonna lie, I was partly embarrassed to show that initial attempt, so I don't even know if I have it. <laughs> and, uh, uh, but, yeah, and I, but it happens, right? It, you, you, that's the whole part of the drawing process. So I, I realized that I had kind of forgotten what I had initially said about blocking in the major values and I was losing that, so I need to really establish that. You can see that you know, this area over here is really noticeably darker than this, and I need to make that more clear now. And there's a kind of a soft gradation in this area. But if anything, what I want to do is prioritize that value. I'd rather go darker in value and then use my eraser to lift it back up than preserve the white of the page too much. Um, it's something I really struggled with early on in drawing is I would just leave too much of the white uh, and it would kind of blow out the drawing it being it too bright. And I found that when I drop everything down in value and I'm not precious with that white, um, that my drawings ultimately became richer as a result. Uh, Liz is saying, your kitten face is not as long as, as mine. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's this proportion here, and actually you may, you may try to look at either these dark spots here, measure down to that chin. I'm kind of just, I've kind of have just regions defined. It's really even hard to lock that down. Let me see, what can I do here? Ah, that's an interesting ratio. Okay, interesting. So this distance here, if we take this dark spot in this lower corner of this ear, the dark spot on the lower corner of this ear, um, it's the same distance as kind of the chin to the kind of the, the top edge. So it should be right here. So this distance here should be the same as the distance between those two. So in this way, the, uh, the, the, the head is a little bit longer. And what I'm observing is that there's this kind of an intersection line here um, between the, the ear and then you can kind of see the soft line of the fur back in here. I had mine too high up, so I'm going to bring that down. So looking at those intersection points between the ears and the top of the head there, and now I can double check again. And that's pretty close. I think I, now I can bring this up just a touch. And I'm just kind of bringing that dark spot. I don't really have that edge defined. How are we doing on time? Oh, 40 minutes already. That's gone by fast. So I better pick up the pace. 
This may take a little bit longer to get through this drawing. <laughs> it's a tough one. And I've been yapping a lot, so I'll try to try to focus more on the drawing. But double check that. So again, those proportions are you know very, very big scale kind of proportions, looking at those two dark spots there, taking that distance, comparing it to the height from the chin to that, that top edge. And that's now it's closer to correct. Uh, and then I'll continue to adjust from there, and it may be I, I may end up having to uh, make the ears even larger. If you haven't, if you're following along and you haven't done this already, make sure you set your drawing up from a, at a distance and check it out. Um, change the context of the work so that you hold it up, look at it from a distance, flip it upside down, hold it in front of a mirror, do whatever you can to reframe in your mind what your drawing looks like because your your brain is constantly calibrating to what's on the page and correcting itself um, and it, we, we become kind of blind to what's actually happening on the page sometimes so um, change the context of the work okay so that's what I'm doing here in the screen in front of me is displaying what you're seeing. So it, it allows me to see my drawing vertically and it's smaller scale. So I can see value relationships more effectively and details. And this needs to really be, I need to really block this in more. I'm being too gentle with my values, I need to go for it. And it's amazing to me, like even at this stage, somebody could look at this and say, that looks like a kitten, right? And there's so much that's still missing. Um, and as, if I had started the drawing with, you know, by finishing one area, say if this part was done, you might be saying, hey, that's going to be a kitten, but it doesn't look like a kitten yet. Um, so this is, this is what I love about this, this kind of mindset is that the whole thing is kind of gradually coming together. And it's almost like a surprise for myself, which is fun. I'm trying to be mindful of the direction of the marks back in here because I'm doing something that I've warned you not to do before. So the fur in general is vertical here, right? In the background, um, you can actually see horizontal lines back there. If my marks for that background are vertical, uh, I run the risk of it flattening out the drawing. It's running parallel to the direction of that fur. So I need to change that up. But it's really hard to get in with some of that negative space so I, without making vertical lines there. So it's just something to look at in your own work is, you know, how is that background reading? And I'm trying to be really mindful to not create strong directional marks back in here. All right. Um, Mauro is asking Blacksmith, how do you record the drawing? What camera do you use? Please respond. I'm using a Sony A6100. That's the one above me right here, just a webcam in front of me on my Mac. Um, and that's all I've got, those two cameras. And that's the same, I, it's the same camera I use to take this reference photo too, so. Okay, what do I want to do? I want to move this along. I'm kind of, I've been, I feel like I've been putzing along, um, sitting in the ugly duckling stage, and now I need to, to pull that back out. Um, I haven't used that term, ugly duckling stage. I know Gigi did in the uh, painting class. Anybody see Gigi's painting together class last, last Thursday? She's coming again tomorrow. Uh, she's doing a, a fish, which is going to be awesome. Acrylic painting class with Gigi Chen. I really enjoyed that, so. Um, but she mentioned the Ugly Duckling stage too, and we connected afterwards. And I said, hey, I've talked about that in my drawing, uh, drawing together. Um, if, you're, if you're new and you're wondering what we're talking about, but I, I really believe that every drawing goes through an Ugly Duckling stage. You get to the point where you're like, I don't know if this is gonna come together. This does not look good. <laughs> and then you, you, keep, you keep going on it, and then it, it pulls together. You fight for it, right? And uh, that's, where I'm at right now, I tell you. So,
Um, but if so, I, I have seen uh, students in the past kind of di get discouraged at that ugly duckling stage. They just say, oh, "Well, this isn't working, so I'm giving up now." And often, it's, it it all can just be resolved by continued work. So, if you're at that point, just keep going. And the worst that can happen if you do keep going with it, even if the drawing crumbles apart, you're going to learn so much from that drawing throughout that process of trying to fix it. Uh, so don't give up on it too early, even if it just becomes a learning exercise for you. Um, that's, that's really my recommendation is turn every um, quote unquote failure into an opportunity. So. Uh, Medieval Peasant is asking about kneaded erasers if they leave a residue. I do not notice any sort of residue. You know, kneaded erasers are simply just kind of a, it's like a rubber putty, and they leave, it leaves far less res residue than a, than a rubber eraser. You know, this is going to leave those big chunks that you might have to, to brush off, but, um, yeah, the, the kneaded eraser I find leaves very little or anything, um, and I don't notice it on my hands, and so I'm constantly playing with a kneaded eraser, and I don't really notice that. Okay, let it, oh, see, Sue saying you watched it. I thought I recognized you in there. I saw a lot of you in the chat. Um, that was awesome to see. Okay, now what I, I think I, I think I have the, the, really the foundation established. I can go in and start refining. And this is where I can start to add some detail. So I'm just doing a quick analysis, doing a check-in with myself to see what do I want to do now. I'm going to keep working on this because then I can move the drawing along without actually having to think about anything. Kind of, I realize that the cat is kind of placed a little bit far on the, to the left. I'm just going to do that. That way I can crop it without having to <laughs> deal with it. Mm -hmm. It's an easy tool for me to simply crop a drawing is just to cut it out of the frame. <laughs> I know it's a little bit harder for you guys, so um, yeah, that works out better. Just move my table. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Maya Martin is asking where I get my art supplies. I typically, you know, I'll order online, but I like I do like to go to Jerry's in, up in Fort Collins. Uh, local Jerry's Art Arama. I have a good variety. Okay. Maddie's mom saying you have to remember just to keep telling yourself it's just a piece of paper. That's right. Um, yeah, the preciousness, it can be really difficult to manage. So, um, yeah, I, I, the more free you can be with the process, the better. Okay, I'm just trying to gather my thoughts right now. I think what I need to do is I need to pull out my, my blending stump. I forgot to mention this in the materials, but for all of you who have been with me for a while, know that this has become now my favorite tool. I love this thing. And I'm just going to kind of knock down some of the tooth of the paper. But as I do that, I want to also be refining some of the the forms here. So as I'm working, like in this area here, it's really a negative drawing process. If the cat's white against that darker background. And so I'm trying to be mindful of the direction of my marks, in particular, as I get to the, the, the fur line, wherever that kind of is. I can kind of see a broad um, line, but it's difficult to find a specific edge. Uh, so what I, what I did in the initial drawing is I tried to use circular marks throughout most of the background so that I don't have strong directional marks and kind of messing with things. Um, and then as I work up to, towards the, the fur line, then I start to, using the side of the pencil in an overhand grip, kind of pull, pull and lift into that space. Let's see if I actually push but it's just kind of, I'm trying to lift off into there and I'm trying to, I'm letting my mind kind of split itself between thinking of that broad line and then kind of that specific edge. Okay. 
and then here it's <laughs> there's these long uh, long hairs that it's really hard to define that edge, but it becomes a little bit clearer in some spots. Um, it's I found that it's it's best to suggest texture as much as possible rather than get bogged down in a particular um, in, in any one particular kind of form. You know, it's so easy to get kind of get locked into you know each individual hairs and drawing trying to draw those. Try to suggest it as much as possible. Let the tooth of the paper, let the material itself um, support you. And in, and in that way, you're, you're kind of thinking just more about the flow of things than anything. So is there a general flow to the direction of the fur in a particular area? And let your marks follow that, that flow more than anything. Wendy is saying, I tend to imitate your marks rather than looking too much at the reference photo. That's good to know. Um, that is, you know, one of my favorite exercises, and maybe I should do that for, for this show here, the drawing together, is um, work on a master copy. So find a drawing specifically by a master artist and then copy that drawing. But the key to that is to not go into that exercise with the idea that you're creating essentially a photocopy, your goal is to try to deconstruct the marks and rebuild that process. So if you see a quick mark, you make a quick mark. You know, if you see a tight controlled, you make a tight controlled mark. Even if they don't look exactly the same, you're trying to mirror the motion that you can see is evidenced by the, the marks on the page. Um, the, the saying that I like to have in my head all the time is that marks are thought. So when you're looking at a drawing by say Leonardo, that's an opportunity to actually jump into Leonardo's head. You're seeing marks that are extensions of the neural activity in his brain, right? He's thinking about stuff and it's coming through on that page. It's like a footprint in the snow, right? And uh, to me, that's the coolest thing in, in drawing. And sometimes you lose that in painting when, you know, if you look at Leonardo, for example, the Mona Lisa has so many layers on it that top layer is so refined. We're just seeing little glimpses of his mind. Um, and a lot of that has just been obscured by that finished layer. Whereas a sketch, that's like raw data. We can see, we can see it happening on the page. But what's, again, what's most critical is to try to reverse engineer those marks. Think about the motion, the pressure, the weight, the material, everything that led into cre the creation of that mark and then let that lead into what you think the the artist's intent was. So I think paying attention to movements and mirroring those things can be really helpful, but you can do that with a still image and find a, find a master copy or ma master image to, to, to copy. It's a great way to learn. All right, so I'm just kind of circling around. Again, I'm trying to think about Trying to think about the uh, you know the flow of things rather than ind any individual piece of hair for okay so now this blending stump has really built up a lot of material as I'm as I'm blending these areas here I'm kind of rolling it in my fingers to try to evenly distribute that um, the graphite and I was being built up on there so now it becomes a really effective drawing tool. So as I do some kind of negative drawing here on this 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 paw on the, the arm there, the leg, um, I'm trying to think about the flow of that fur along that edge and kind of build, pushing into that. As we come up here, just kind of lightly feathering it out. Um, and this is, you know, with the reference photo, you may find it valuable to actually manipulate that photo a little bit um, and have maybe a couple versions of it. One where you really kind of, if you can adjust the brightness, it'll show some of those mid-tones and the darks a little bit clearer. And then if you boost the brightness, you might actually see more subtlety in some of the dark areas. Uh, and so having, um, and a lot of artists will do this, they'll take multiple 
kind of exposures of the reference to get that. You'll get different information um, with, uh, with different exposures of the same reference. And I'm using the, the, the blending stump now really as a mark making tool um, in that over, same overhand grip as I did with the, the, um, the ebony pencil. Thinking just kind of about the flow of things. Uh, right down in here, we're about an hour in, so I want to move this thing along. And what I'm going to do is just really kind of lightly just sketch in the, uh, some of this area over here. And I think that's going to ultimately serve me well in the drawing. And I think if I had unlimited time, I would stick with it and probably finish this area. But if I'm short on time, I need to make a decision about what what gets neglected. And if I neglect this area, it'll actually help me to pull attention to this area that's going to be more detailed. So that's kind of what I'm what I'm thinking about here is uh, trying to be intentional with with those with these marks here. All right, so if we come up here, so this is where I was talking earlier about how, you know, this is really kind of blown out in the reference photo. Um, and so with, with this blending stump as my tool, I can create a more gentle mark um, that will hopefully not overwhelm the, um, overwhelm the values in the drawing. So just kind of, I'm just kind of building up material on the blending stump right now. And I can come in over here and now actually draw. And now as I make these shapes, I'm trying to observe kind of two things at once, what that overall shape is, and then also be thinking about the flow of the fur. So then I can allow the directionality of the marks to make a statement about the, about the flow of the fur. I could suggest that. Uh, so I'm going to need to make this kind of path up here, this progression. Before I do that, I want to, I'm just kind of preparing myself. I'm trying to figure out where it's going to go. And then I'm going to, then I can kind of strike. So just a quick, you know, set of um, practiced movements will help me to visualize where that, that path follows. And as I'm doing that, I'm, as a, I'm kind of rocking the material so that it's lighter on both ends, putting emphasis on the center of the stroke. And then you know, something like that may be sufficient for that part of the drawing, and I don't need to really add any more detail. And if, you know, if, we, if I do end up finishing this more quickly, I can always go, at, go in and add more. All right. Only crazy. Oh, I suddenly heard a man's voice talking while I was doing something on my computer. Your live just popped out of nowhere in the background. And now that I see what it's about, I, I want to stay awesome. Well, welcome. That is awesome to see. <laughs> you just your computer led you to this drawing together episode. If you are new, again, we do this every Wednesday, 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we come up with a new drawing subject, and we just get here, you know, just gather together to draw together, talk about all things art, drawing. Um, all right, so now I'm, I'm just kind of going through, and I'm starting to just kind of refine it, things a little bit. And what's happening now, though, is I'm also... I'm kind of predicting what needs to be hap what needs to happen next. I'm trying to essentially scan this whole area now, looking more critically at the details, and I'm creating a mental plan in my mind about what needs to happen. This this area here is really kind of throwing me off, so I'd like to refine that a little bit more. Um, uh, Colleen is asking a really good question about these blending stumps. Do I use the same stump for both charcoal and graphite? What I do and what I should do might be two different things there. So <laughs> I, I have in the past, but that has been largely out of my own negligence. And so I, I think it's best to not mix those two. The graphite is just such a slick material. It can sometimes um, impede the, the flow of the charcoal. 
um, and then vice versa. If you're picking up charcoal on your on your blending stump and you're laying it down on top of the of the graphite, it could cause trouble. But at the same time, I've done it many times just because I wasn't paying attention, and you can make the drawing work. Um, and who knows, you may end up finding that it it leads to something really positive in your work that you want to apply. So that's just kind of my, I guess it was an answer. Um, I have a hard time communicating in absolutes if you haven't figured that out already. So I think there's always exceptions and it's in those exceptions where uh, advancements happen and so I get excited when things don't kind of go as planned or um, and I discover something new about a material. All right, so I'm just using my blending stump here to draw a little bit and I'm, I'm trying to mark in the kind of the, the key features. So again, if you're, if you're at this stage here, the challenge is to do, you know, continually be checking in on where you're at. Your location on the page, the scale of the marks is really critical here. And it's so easy to get focused on the specific shape of the eye, for example. And you can get that shape 100% correct, but if it's not in the right spot, you're kind of out of luck. Like that's not, it's not gonna work. It's gonna, bo it's gonna bother you, right? And so the, that's where getting the, the placement right is ultimately more critical than anything. And in a lot of ways, you'll find that if you get the proportions right, you get the, that placement right, it's very forgiving in terms of the detail. You can be off by, by a fair amount if you get the proportions right. So right in here, I'm seeing like this alternating sequence of light and dark, and I'm doing my best to not lift out this area here Actually, what I want to do is darken the area around it rather than, um, you know, rather than lighten that spot. Okay. Let's see. Just focusing a little bit more, and I realize that I'm. I'm not talking. If you do have any questions about what what is happening, if I'm not explaining anything kind of clearly, I really do more than welcome questions. I I need those questions. Um, I need to know if if a concept isn't landing, um, so then I can see if I can come at it a better way, or if you have a better way of explaining it. I love to I love to have that experience. Um, so if if these thoughts just are not resonating with you, I want to hear it. All right, so I'm really sticking with this blending stump to refine some of them. It's just a, kind of a gentler mark. It's noticeable, um, but it's not quite as intense as the graphite. Um, now I'm really, this, this is causing me trouble. The, the mouth is throwing me off, even though it's not going to be finished. need to squint at the end. So here's what happened is I started to focus too much on the mouth. It's messing me up. So I needed to squint again. Um, now I can kind of go back in. This is where switching to that tripod grip. Um, gives me a bit more precision. Correct, do some negative drawing here, kind of correct some of that, that edge. And I'm just trying to find some of that, kind of a few key points. And it's really this, what I love about this subject is it kind of highlights that, the power of bringing into focus just a few key areas. You know, we kind of take for granted oftentimes that high level of detail is, is the way to go. And that could, certainly can be, depending on you know who you are, uh, you know what your motivations for drawing are. 
but it doesn't have to always be the case. So I'm just kind of cleaning up some of this area, adding a little bit of detail. Um, yeah, oh, I'm missing a bunch of questions. Any questions? Ah, Sue was saying, adding the mouth and nose might help. I missed that earlier. That's exactly what I was thinking. Um, it was good, good instinct on your part. Now, like, this is going to give me something to focus on, and then from there I can kind of go back and bring everything else into focus as I need to. So I'm getting this kind of worked out. Um, if, and if, if in doubt, if you don't know what direction to make your marks, Go in just a kind of a circular motion, like these kind of tight circles that I'm working with right now. And I'll kind of switch back to this modified grip that allows me to kind of pivot between, you know, engaging the tip and getting more detail and then kind of broader marks as well. I think what I need to do is lift out a little bit more that highlight on the nose. So this is where I'm going to use the kneaded eraser. It gives you a softer mark than the rubber eraser, and I think that's going to serve me well. So I, in general, if I, you know, sometimes I know right away I need the I need a rubber eraser to, to create a mark. Um, if I don't know, then what I'll do is I'll often um, try the kneaded eraser first, and if that's not giving me what I want, if I need more pressure, for example, then I'll switch to the... Uh, switch to the, the rubber eraser. And then the cat's left eye, should that be closer to the center? I, I believe so. I think I'm gonna have to make some adjustments here. <sighs> Something is off. Because, and this is this is looking at that, uh, who's, who asked that question? Is that, uh, yeah, Judy at Grass made that comment. Um, and I think you're right. So I'm looking at that kind of transition here. But before I do that, I kind of lock that the nostrils in, and may, that may be incorrect. So I'll do a quick check in on those as well. I'm gonna reestablish that center line that kind of that had kind of deviated a bit. And then I come up here. I do think, yeah, Judy, you're right, that this I feel like I'm feeling pretty confident about placement of that nostril. So this, if I look at this space between, and this eye comes in. There, that feels a bit better. When you get to the eyes, um, you know, I'm trying to kind of break that curve down into a series of kind of short straight marks rather than create a kind of a distinct almond shape. And that's going to give me a more precise, kind of an accurate um, form there. And I need to I need to keep referring to the, the screen in front of me because what I'm seeing here is very different on the screen. Um, the light, the way the light's glancing off of it, it's it's kind of throwing me off. So if that's happening to you as well, you know, it, that's something that can happen in graphite in particular is that just this reflective quality can sometimes disrupt your interpretation, your, your understanding of that, um, of the marks you're making. Oh, Medieval Peasant saying you heard yesterday that kneaded erasers will leave a residue that will, could show up years down the road. That is pretty wild. I had not heard that, but it's good to know. 
Um, so um, as uh, Judy had mentioned that, you know, pointed out the, the proportions in the eye. So I'm making those adjustments there, but I also got to remember that that's, it's all part of a system, right? Yeah, I need to check in with everything else now. If I move that eye, I need to make sure that, every, that the ears are placed properly now, that it's, again, kind of in the same, the correct position with regards to the, uh, the nose. Like this just feels too, too great here. But I could be, could be right. So I'm going to compare that. It's actually not too far off. I think this needs to come down just a touch. Uh, Maddie's mom, yeah, it's talking about the drawing coming together similar to a, a photograph in a dark room. That's exactly it. I, I really love that experience. Um, uh, Donna is saying, if you're looking for exact proportions, maybe the head height from eyes to ears is a bit too long, but I think it's fine. Yes, that's exactly, I, I don't know when you typed that, but that's exactly what I was thinking. I think we came to that same realization at the right time, at the same time. It's, uh, it's funny. Um, I just, I feel like when I look at the reference photo, the eyes just, I, I get pulled into the eyes. And so it feels larger than I think they actually are. So I need to kind of, a, I need to look at that more critically. And so if I'm looking at this distance here, it does, it definitely does feel too, um, too big. Uh, but I need to, I need to double check that. And then, then the question is, do the, um, yeah, that, that, that is, I think, uh, kind of reforming my thoughts here. So yeah, <laughs> you're hearing me fumble. So if I look at this distance between the ears here, uh, but, or, uh, between these two dark spots in this one ear, that should essentially be the same distance as this. And you can see that it's not really even close. Um, I'm way off. So the question is, do I keep this and adjust these, or do I adjust the eyes and keep that? And I am going to, I don't know, what's your suggestion? I would love to hear your suggestions on this one because I'm kind of, while I'm thinking through that, what do you think? Should I adjust the ears and keep the eyes or do I make the, essentially the eyes bigger? Kelly's asking about the in, the, in the meantime, while you're considering that and you're offering me suggestions, um, the, this is an ebony pencil that I'm using. This is, it's not a, um, it's not a Prismacolor, it's the Soho, which I believe is the Jerry's kind of brand. Bring the ears down, says Adele. That's one vote for that. All right, we're getting a couple. I'm gonna let the others. Everybody's saying, I get more people saying, keep the eyes as they are, and then we'll bring the ears down. And then, uh, all right, let's do it then. Okay, so in that, uh, um, Sue is saying, lower the ears and raise the left eye, especially at the tear duct. Yes, yeah, so, so what I'll do then is if the consensus is to bring the ears down and adjust those, I need to lock this down. This is going to become an anchor. So let me sit with this for a little bit um, and... And I'm going to really try to finish this. Uh, I hope I'm not leaning into the shot too much. I'm going to try to stay out of that. Um, and I feel like just in general, this eye needs to get bigger. Uh, one of the things I'm trying to do, the, the, the challenge with graphite is that it, it, it's such a hard material compared to charcoal that it can emboss the page. And I'm trying to use kind of a light touch as much as possible. But uh, it's... Um, Grace is saying that you're enjoying the, the image. It is a challenge, isn't it? <laughs> Like I said, this kicked my butt. 
uh, when I was doing the prep. It was really, and I, I should have known better, you know, I, like I, uh, when I chose the subject, I'm like, yeah, who doesn't like kittens? We should do kittens. They're fun. And, uh, and then I realized why we shouldn't do kittens because they're so hard. Um, but <laughs> uh, that's what we, that's what we do, right? We got to challenge ourselves. You know, so many, so many great paintings are done just, just to see if they could be done, right? And not to prove um, necessarily anything, but to say, hey, what is that? Is it even possible? Is it, is it possible to capture an emotion? Is it possible to capture the atmosphere in the sky rather than the object and uh, things like that? So, okay. All right, I'm doing my best to try to ignore this because that's really throwing me off, right? So I'm, I'm gonna do this, let's see if that helps. So as I'm building this, you can see I'm using this kind of overhand um, kind of approach and I'm trying to also think about the, the direction of the fur. kind of following along that direction of the fur there. And this is where I'm gonna pull out the, this is that Krita color. It's gonna get me darker marks. Yeah, the, uh, uh, was it talking about the slant of the eyes? Definitely, this, this is where I'm, uh, I'm kind of going through, looking at the slant of the eyes, kind of cleaning things up using this dark, this dark kind of Krita color. Um, and I really like the way it's working with the, uh, uh, working with the ebony pencil. I'm going to do my best to use the side of the pencil. And you can make these really micro adjustments to things like the slant of the eye, slight adjustments to the proportions. What is happening there? Okay. I need to look at that. Again, the glare, the glare that I'm seeing is not being picked up by the camera. So I need to look at the, the screen. Here we go. I have to draw from that more. And then I'm going to erase out this highlight right in here. See how that works. Try blending a little bit. I need to really, when it comes to the pupil of the cat, you know, of course it's that kind of elongated form. Uh, drawing and coloring is asking what I'm using for the darker area. So this is a, a, a Krita color Nero pencil. So this is a, Savoy Fair product that I really enjoy. I've heard Lyra's are really good. Um, so the reference image that I have um, is, it's kind of blowing out the darks a little bit. The, the, the one on the screen is actually a little bit better, but I can't see it from here. <laughs> it's too small. So I'm trying to do my best to understand where uh, where this line is here. I can use my previous drawing. So I had the darker shape, but I hadn't really defined the corner of the eye. Um, oh, this is awesome. So Maddie's mom's also talking about the, the size and the angles of the ears. This is the kind of stuff that, this is, this is one of the other things I love about drawing, right? Is like, we, this gives us an opportunity to sit with a subject and really understand it in a way that we never really would in normal circumstances. Um, the way our brain is designed, you know, we, we can take a, a quick glance at something and in that split second that we're looking at something, our brain takes in all of that optical information and processes it and says, all right, that's a kitten. And then it sends to our conscious mind, the knowledge that that's a kitten. And that's what we think is like, oh, we understand that that's a kitten. We know everything about it. But the truth is, is like, we don't, 
really know what it looks like without kind of more intense scrutiny and that's what drawing gives us and so I want you know when we, when we go back to kind of again the, the process of drawing and allowing the drawing to emerge on the page the um, we're also allowing the drawing to emerge at the pace of our observations so that we're learning more about the subject um, and as we do that, that informs our drawing, and the drawing process informs our observation. As we go through the drawing, we ask ourselves a certain set of questions to better understand the, the subject. And then, you know, we, we look at, well, what are the proportions? What is the angle? What, are the, um, what is actually happening here? And in that way, we're examining the part of our brain that in that split second understood that this was a cat. All right, so here I'm kind of just building from the eyes. I feel like that's working better. Yeah, Donna is saying, yes, definitely working from life is always best. It, in this way, it's, it, it would be really challenging working with a kitten. Um, and even and just with a live show, I thought about that, having trying to have a, a subject that I could work from life from, and it's just it, very difficult to make that happen. So as a result, I'm working from colored photographs, but I do encourage you, if you are working on improving your skills, that you, you know, you uh, take some time to work from life. So and when it comes down to the fur, as I'm looking at this stuff, you can see how I'm using the side of the pencil, and it's really just a light touch, and I'm constantly rolling that pencil so I have a new sharp edge that I'm working with. And in that way, the point of the pencil is always maintained, so I can always use that when I need to really have control. And that these little, I'm gonna kind of suggest the whisker points. Yeah, the, the skull definitely is. Oh, a turtle suit, I have a, there's a turtle upstairs, Turbo. I should, uh, should work with him. He's pretty, pretty quick. Should do a turtle. Although one of the one of the best exercises I did to improve my drawing skills, and I've mentioned this, and it's been a while, so I, I don't know if anybody really remembers this, but it was in my undergrad years, and we had to do an assignment that took several weeks to complete, and it was, this was for a figure drawing, and um, I instead of doing one full scale drawing, what I did is I asked my professor if I could um, do a lot of gesture drawings. And so I, I grabbed two sketchbooks, one sketchbook per week in this two-week assignment, and I would go out regularly and I would sketch uh, people walking. And this was at the time in the airports when you can go, go pretty far into the airport and just kind of hang out, um, or I'd go to the mall and I would sketch people as they walked by, and you'd have five, ten seconds or so to get a quick gesture in. First half of the sketchbook went horribly. You know, I just could not figure it out. But eventually my brain caught on, and I was able to kind of get into this rhythm. And but you know, so about halfway through that sketchbook, I started to get drawings that actually started to represent things just in those few seconds. Um, and I really I found that really valuable. So if, if you're looking for an alternative, you know, something to help boost your skills, um, really consider rapid fire sketching and gesture drawing because you learn so much. When you think about that, in, in, in a five second drawing, you're still considering so much of what we're doing here. You're looking at form and shape, movement, you know, proportions. You just have a few seconds to catch that. Um, and in, in that way though, if you think about those quick gestures, you're getting, you're just doing a lot of drawing in a short amount of time. So much of the drawing, um, drawing time is actually spent doing things that aren't really advancing your, your skill beyond hand-eye coordination. Um, all right, so I'm kind of just building that area. Um, and I had kind of forgotten the whole, <laughs> the whole objective of lowering the ears. So I'm glad I haven't moved over to the ears yet. Okay, I need to kind of get to that spot right now. 
Let's see. So now I'm going to kind of work out from that. Uh, I'm going to measure the eye. So the width of the eye right here takes us almost to this dark spot. So that dark spot should be right around here. This comes down to here. Now the question, it may be, it's, it may be that actually that, that tip of the ear is fine. I'm just, gonna re I'm just gonna move that dark spot down. Okay, come across here. We got this dark spot, kind of doing some negative drawing. Um, so, and then as I'm working with the fur, as I'm thinking about this stuff, I'm also I'm thinking about pushing and pulling the marks. And you can create some really wonderful thin, fine lines using an overhand grip. Um, you don't have to use the tip of the pencil to create a fine mark. And in a way, you can actually create more detail, more precision using the edge of a pencil than the tip. So as I'm doing this, this is actually I'm dragging across here. Alice saying you're drawing along with the ebony. That's good to hear. It's working for you. Okay, I'm coming up here. This, the, I'm kind of doing negative drawing. I'm trying to think of both the positive and negative space in here. It's that shape of that light. You know, going back to the idea of sketching, you know, what I, the, the urban sketcher movement is a really fascinating um, kind of movement. You know, a lot of people from all over the world that get into sketching, and it's, it's all about being kind of present in the space and reacting to the space around you and um, coming up with your own relationship with the materials. And something to check out. I know we have some stuff on artistnetwork.com with some. Some great urban sketchers, Mark Terrell Holmes, you know, Gigi, she's done work with urban sketching. So this is still that Nero pencil, that dark one that's kind of floating on top of the charcoal of the graphite. Um, and again, I'm kind of radiating out from the center. I'm kind of just floating around. I can feel my mind is getting distracted. <laughs> I'm bouncing all over the place now. So if you're as well, then welcome to the club. It's kind of like, I don't know, when I, when I read a book, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll notice I have to kind of fight to stay in a linear progression. I'll be reading along and I'll just skip to the end of a sentence or skip to the last sentence in a paragraph and I'll have to go back and that's what's happening here. And I don't know whether, I think... I feel like drawing influenced that because, you know, it's drawing is it's not linear the way, you know, we read from, you know, left to right, top, to bottom, generally. And, um, and instead we dart all over the place uh, with our, our observations being captured by our intention being a captured by a contrast, things like that. And uh, it's very nonlinear. Okay. Yeah, so and if you want to share your work, that's a great idea. You know, we have a post. A lot of people share their work on our Facebook feed in the, in the post that we, you know, promoting the, the episode. Uh, but also, again, there's the link in the description to the show page for this episode where you can share your work. And you can find all the episode pages there on Artist Network in the Drawing Together page. Or um, you can see each episode has its own page and people have been sharing their, their drawings as they're completed. Okay, so now I'm working my way up again. These are these ear tips are wrong as far as I know, or at least I'm re-evaluating them. Kind of doing some quick angle sighting. Trying to find the slant between these ears. And so there's a positive and negative drawing happening here. So as I'm working on these um, 
these dark spots, the way I make the mark will suggest the white, lighter hairs on top of them. So I'm actually drawing the ear, but I'm also thinking about those light hairs on, sitting on top. Oh, it's interesting. Yeah, so I think I, you know, my, in general, my initial proportions were largely correct. I just like I think the tip of the ears is generally correct, but I had not really rendered the base of the ears effectively. But I think the key here is if you know when you're when you're confronted with a proportional challenge, you're trying to fix the proportions of something. You generally have two ways of doing that. You, 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 can, you can adjust the thing you're working on or you can adjust the stuff around it. Whew, okay, I wanna actually bring, there's this light here. I can bring out, just kind of suggest that form back there. You can tell I'm starting to lose steam. Anybody else feel like at the end of a drawing, you've just been sitting in like, like a, a math exam or something forever? <laughs> My brain just gets exhausted trying to focus on all this stuff. Uh, there's so much thinking that happens in drawing. You know, drawing is all about the sets of decisions we make. There's so many little decisions that we make. It's so much focus that comes into it. It can be a form of meditation, but it can also be wicked exhausting sometimes. So. Okay. Interesting. So I feel like that actually area that worked out all right. Those overall proportions are coming together. So I didn't actually have to bring the ears down a whole lot. I just needed to actually make them larger. So all right, now we're going to move into this one. You can see these long kind of wispy hairs coming up here. So I'm just kind of pushing along that edge. So as I do this, I want to, I need to kind of visualize where this edge is going to be and I'm going to create it by kind of building together marks that flow in the direction of that fur rather than draw that line down there. If that makes sense. Um, I really can't wait to see all your drawings here if you get them all posted on Artist Network. Thank you all for being patient with me today. This has been a challenging one. Um, I don't know if you remember the, the self-portrait I did really early on in the series. Holy smokes, that was brutal. But you all came to my rescue, helped me figure out the proportions. Uh, and that was awesome. Yeah, that was pretty wicked. Um, well, and I should I should do more portrait work, but I it's definitely not in my wheelhouse, and so I kind of shy away from them. It's just something I don't feel quite as comfortable with, and I need to practice what I preach. And and uh, challenge myself in those areas. All right, I need to. This was found myself getting so consumed by detail that I kind of lost sight of the fact that these, this proportion was just off. Okay, how's that? It feels a bit better. I feel like, yeah, there's some, still some proportional issues, but it's better. It's better, which it should be. I guess we've been working on it this long. Okay. Wendy's saying your eyes look too human. Well, that'd be interesting. 
Yeah, it's eyes are really particular. I don't know if we've really spent much time talking about symbol systems here, but um, in general, you know, I talked earlier about how when we when we're confronted with something, we would look at something. Our brain takes in all that optical information, and it says, "Look, you don't have to know everything. You don't need to know how I know that that's a cat. You know, I'm just going to do all that work for you, and I'm just going to tell your conscious mind that you're looking at a cat." Um, in that process, often what comes to mind is, um, especially when we're drawing, is what we refer to as a symbol system. That's a preconceived notion about how something looks or how it should be drawn. And you think about eyes. Eyes are one of the er first things we really learn to draw when we start to focus on, on drawing. And we often create them very symbolically, very simple kind of ovals. And, um, and that forms a certain amount of muscle memory. It, and, it, and that's the part of our conscious mind that we, we latch onto when we're drawing. And a lot of times, if you don't take the time to really observe the subject like we're doing here, then, um, then we end up drawing from that symbol system, the, that, that built-in um, kind of preconceived idea of how it should be drawn. Um, and, and it's really hard to break. So even if you see the specific shape of the eyes, we, all, we often have all those years of practice drawing eyes in a particular way. Um, and this is where, you know, if you've read that book, Drawing on the Right Side of the Brain, you'll know, have challenges um, geared towards helping you break that by, um, by having you work upside down or in a mirror or something like that. So you're seeing the form in an entirely new way, so your brain cannot rely on that symbol system as much, if that makes sense. So I just I hope you're all being kind to yourself. We are, when we're drawing, uh, I call this optical drawing, when we're drawing optically and making things look how we observe them, we're actually having to override a lot of processes that are automatic in our brain. So it's not easy and it takes practice, generally. Okay, what do we think? I'm just gonna, gonna move over here. I'm just gonna lightly sketch this. Kind of paw in, try to suggest, rather than define. Because we, you've been with me over an hour and a half already. Holy smokes, it's been a long one. Um, just want to move this thing along for you. What do you think? Is this getting better? I think it's getting better. And I haven't really pulled out the eraser because the next step is to get those highlights reestablished. I do feel like something needs to happen here in the mouth. I haven't given that much tension. So what am I, what do I need to do here? I think that's working out all right. What's missing is this structure down in here seems like defined. It feels like this one, this large blob look at the reference photo, it makes sense. I understand it as the, whatever ha is happening with that fur there. So I, right now it's a distraction, so I need to figure out how to not make it a distraction. Sometimes you just don't know. Sometimes you just gotta try things out. I feel like that works out a little bit better. That little spot right there helped. Um, uh, Donna's saying, it messes up your correct perception of the lines and planes if you go with the idea of the thing rather than the actual thing in front of you. Yes, exactly. Um, Kelly, <laughs> yeah, like the, you're it's making a comment about professional artists struggling once in a while too. Definitely more than once in a while, right? It's 
messing up is an essential part of the process. So I think that's that's kind of the fundamental shift that occurs um, in in an evolution of an artist is that you know there's initially there's a rejection of messing up, right? You know, we just want to get to the point where we don't mess up anymore. And then eventually, you be, when you as you become a professional, you realize that's a futile gesture, and you will always mess up. And so the question is, how do you recontextualize those mistakes and turn them into a positive? Um, but no one escapes the messing up. Um, you know, you look at you look at somebody even like Picasso, right? And you know, he's he was very gifted as a you know in rendering as as a young artist. And he had to move in a completely different way because he felt like he was messing up when he was rendering things too much. And so, all right. Just going to kind of build up more value in along here. Trying to be really kind of loose and gestural with these marks. Again, using the side of the pencil, I'm constantly rolling it, trying to suggest these forms. If you, if you switch to this tripod grip and you start drawing lines, this is where things could really fall apart. So if I go in here and I draw lines, that's a signal to the brain that that's an, actually a separate object. Those marks represent the edges of an object when in fact they're not. This is just, um, you know, just dark spots on that one object. So I'm just gonna kind of lightly sketch in some of these areas, see if I can bring this together enough. I think we can pretty much call it a day soon. Um, I'm going to move back to the, the ebony pencil and provide some kind of sharper edges along in here. So I'm just using the side of the pencil. I'm pushing and pulling, but I'm trying to think about marks. I'm kind of rocking the marks a little bit so that it, uh, it's not leaving hard edges at the, at the end of each stroke. They're, I'm putting the emphasis on the center of each mark and um, that'll feel more natural. So I'm just in a few areas, I'm going to add some kind of sharper edges so the lack of focus doesn't become a distraction. Um, but again, I want the focus to be on here more. And I'm not getting every, every hair right. If you're working on toned paper, I can't remember who was it that was working on toned paper. Um, uh, you can use your, your white charcoal to kind of bring in some of that that value. So I think we're pretty well, I think we got through this. It was a tough one today. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> um, let me see what happens if I erase out some of the light from the ears there. But thank you all for being patient with me. Um, I'm just gonna, you know, as I'm doing this, kind of erase out some of the, the highlights and some of the fur. Right in here, for example. Just like with the blending stump, it's an opportunity to define and refine the form. So I'm, I'm thinking about the angle of them and capturing the, the fur. Uh, but again, I want to thank you all for being, you know, helpful through this and really supportive, um, giving me suggestions. That's why we're drawing together, and it's not just the show's not called "Watch Me Draw." It's drawing together. Um, it's kind of fun working with the eraser there. Um, I wonder if I can actually zoom in on some of that. I don't know if that's really showing up much, but it's kind of light on the screen here. You can see some of the um, some of the eraser marks. And this is where I said earlier, not I'm not precious with the white of the paper because then it opens up opportunities like this where you can use that eraser to, to lift off and create some really interesting shapes. Um, and so it's not just a, an additive process, it's also subtractive. I can push that back there. There we go. 
I know that's bouncing around right there, but that's fun. I'm kind of getting lost in now these eraser marks, so <laughs> I apologize. Um, but I think we're pretty, again, we're pretty much done here. So if you do need to, to bounce, again, these go up as uh, recordings afterwards. So if you're going to be, if you're going to watch these and kind of draw along with the recording, you're more than welcome to do that. I look forward to seeing you all again on uh, next Wednesday, again, 3 p.m. Can't remember what we're doing. I think it's the old farmhouse. I know we're doing an old farmhouse soon. Um, uh, and I, I want to do some more landscape drawing. There we go. Let me zoom back out. There. All right. Thank you so much. I'm just going to hang out here, answer any additional questions, but I think we're, uh, I think we're pretty much there. Judy's asking, will I erase and draw the whiskers? I should do that. How do I want to do that? Let me give it a shot. So this, sure, I've got these two erasers here. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take my razor blade. It's going to go like that. So now I've just carved it like this, giving me that sharp edge. And I can get a little bit more, kind of get a, get a finer mark there. And again, just thinking more about the the flow than anything. Now the whiskers here are in shadow, so I want to be really gentle with those. I, I don't want to be lifting off as much. And I'm not able to really lift off anything. But I think if I can kind of suggest, and that's starting to give me some sort of some sort of mark. I also have now I have this small triangular piece that I can use to really kind of lean in on it a bit more. And so one of the things I've learned in, t in terms of working with the eraser is um, in, in an area like this, I need to lean on it a little bit more, but I don't want, if I do that, it kind of squishes the eraser and it creates a kind of a blotchy mark. So what I try to do then is just kind of, if I have that sharp edge, I place it on there and then it's just a matter of these really short but delicate kind of vibrations. And that can sometimes be enough just to lift off a little bit of that, that material. So it kind of suggesting the whiskers there, but I get my, my big concern is I don't want to, I don't want those to really hop off the page. I want them to be more suggested. All right. So yeah, now look at that. I got that nice sharp edge. I can use that for future drawings. This is actually a plastic eraser, which I really like, but you can do that with, uh, not needed, but uh, rubber erasers as well. And then with the sharp edge, I can also kind of suggest kind of just the grain of the fur. Uh, and it's right now, it's doing a lot of blending more than anything. With the fur, especially on the top, one of the instincts is to create really kind of consistent and even marks. So just make sure that you know, the, the bunches, the direction is always changing. Once some are larger, some are smaller. I have these here that are they're kind of evenly spaced. So I need to create some more variety. Variety is really important there. If they're too evenly spaced, it kind of stands out as being artificial. Um, so just kind of pay attention to that. So I'm glad you forced me to do those whiskers. Um, What do we think? I think that works out all right. Okay. Phew! Lindy, it looks like you're doing a great job. I can't wait to see what you got. Uh, Kathy, can't wait to see what you've got. Judy, too. 
Um, I think that is, I think it's going to be done. JC is saying that your kitty is a bit frightening, but Halloween is coming. So I hope it <laughs> was not that scary. Um, I really enjoyed this. This has been a lot of fun today. So thank you all. Um, I look forward to it. If you go to artistnetwork.com, if you go to the Drawing Together page, you will see what's coming up next because I, um, my brain is a bit shot right now and I can't for the life of me remember what, what's coming up next. Uh, so I'll be working on that preparatory sketch soon. I'll get that posted. And as always, keep drawing. See you next Wednesday. Thank you and have a beautiful weekend.